Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Working with Difficult People. My name is Jeff Murphy, and I'm an Associate Director in the BU Alumni Relations Office, as well as a proud alumnus of the BU Quest from School of Business. Today's webinar is sponsored by the BU Alumni Association and is offered to our 300,000 alumni around the globe. Throughout your career, the BU Alumni Association is committed to helping you define and achieve your professional goals. We aim to do this by providing alumni with access to a series of valuable online tools and social media communities. It's important that we get your opinion on how we're doing, so we very much look forward to receiving your feedback via a survey that will be emailed to all of you later today. I know we have alumni joining us today from as far away as Spain and Morocco, from some of our big alumni cities like Philadelphia, Denver, and Chicago and of course tons of alumni who are here in Massachusetts. For each and every one of you out there, please know that we really do value your opinion on this and every program that we offer. Before I introduce today's speaker, some brief housekeeping notes. As you know by now, this webinar is being hosted on the Adobe Connect online meeting platform. If you experience any kind of trouble with the audio or visual portions of the presentation, I'll ask that you please contact Adobe Connect directly. I'll give you a phone number if you want to jot that down. It's 1-800-422-3623. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be made available for on-demand viewing on the BU Alumni Association website, which you can find at www.bu.edu slash alumni. That's bu.edu backslash alumni. Our speaker today is very eager to answer any questions that you may have, and you're welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A chat box that you should see at the bottom of your screen. We hope to get to as many questions as we can during today's webinar. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of people chatting in with some personal stories to tell. I'll ask that you please keep your questions to just one or two short sentences and that way we can get to as many as we can. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day. Presenting from San Diego, California is College of Fine Arts Acting Program alumnus Greg Ward. Greg tells me that he's actually lived three lives in the 55 years he's been on the planet. His first life was as an award-winning actor, playwright, director, and producer in New York and London. His second life was as a freelance correspondent on assignment throughout Western Europe for BBC Radio and other UK media. And his third life is what he's doing now, serving as a keynote speaker, author, consultant, and executive coach for industry and government. Greg's first book, which is called Bad Behavior, People Problems, and Sticky Situations, a tool book for managers and team leaders, was released in 2002 and is now on sale at what Greg describes as the ridiculously reduced price on Amazon.com. His second book, called The Respectful Leader, is due out next year. In his spare time, Greg umpires Little League Baseball, and he usually finds that the children on the field behave like responsible adults, and the adults in the stands usually behave like irresponsible children, which, of course, I think very much informs the topic that he's here to talk about today. Greg, thanks for so much. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. Really appreciate your time. I'm going to go ahead and get your slide deck up and running, and then um, the floor is all yours. Very good. Thank you very much, Jeff. And just to uh, follow on what Jeff was talking about, in the midst of working in New York City as an actor, writer, director, producer, I found myself, like many uh, artists, uh, without much money at all. And one day I was working as a temp in an office in the City University of New York where they asked me if I could help them design a training program for police officers. And uh, we did that. It used uh, live professional actors in the program, and it was very successful. And uh, much of what I do now involves using professional actors in training programs for corporations and for uh, uh, government as well. So just forwarding the slide here and hoping it will come up for me. It's taking a while there, Jeff. There we go. Sorry, it went too fast on me now. As Jeff said, I had a, my first book came out in 2002, and it's called Bad Behavior, People, Problems, and Sticky Situations. And we just re-released that book this year. And you can find it on Amazon.com uh, and also on BarnesandNoble.com. And it's also available in e-version as well. So it was a cold, crisp January morning in New York City in 1994, and I had returned from Europe after many years abroad, and I was a few months 
into a brand new job as a producing artistic director of an educational theater company. And we'd been given a commission by a very big name company to develop a new training program on diversity and inclusion in the workplace. And we were having our very first development meeting with our sponsor, a panel of diversity experts, myself as facilitator, and my boss, the executive director, who was also brand new in her job. And I thought the meeting was going really, really well until my boss made this gesture. In other words, Greg, shut up. A number of people in the room saw her do it. And I was so surprised and so humiliated that I immediately stopped talking. And so she stepped in and started facilitating the meeting for the rest of the day. And out in the hallway afterwards, I was so angry with her that I could barely get the words out when I said, don't you ever do something like that in public to me again. And she refused to apologize. She said I was talking too much and that I needed to shut up. And uh, it was a very tense moment. And knowing me, I probably was talking too much. And yet I think we can all agree that what she did in that very public way was very disrespectful and humiliating. Now, I'm sad to say that this was only the proverbial tip of the iceberg with my boss. Uh, there were plenty of other behaviors that I found very difficult to deal with, and eventually I left the company, and my difficult boss was one of the primary reasons that I quit. So what is this webinar about? Hey, Greg, sorry uh, to interrupt. I think we might have a little disconnect with how you're clicking through the slides. Um, okay. We're showing the difficult people slide right now. Um, I've just moved it back to what's this webinar about. If it's helpful, I'm happy to click through these for you unless you want to keep going. Well, that's interesting. I don't know quite what happened there because I was clicking and it wasn't responding. And now okay. it seems to be responding. Uh, maybe I should ask, well, I, I, I need to click through. So let's keep trying and sure. see how it goes. Okay. Sounds good. All right, so what's the webinar about? Well, it's about difficult people at work, uh, like my boss and the impact that they have on individuals and organizations. And also, it's about primarily what are the coping strategies that you can use to deal with these difficult people in your lives. Uh, I'm, I'll be the first to say that um, it is not easy for many of us to deal with difficult people. And uh, I am not a lawyer or an industrial psychologist. And the techniques I'm going to teach you have been used for decades and have been proven in many cases to work, but they don't always work. And they could backfire, especially if the difficult person you work with is your boss. So you need to be very, very careful and make some very specific decisions about whether or not you're going to go forward with doing this. And I strongly urge you, before you engage in any of these active coping strategies that you talk with your HR and legal department uh, just to protect yourself, just to make sure you're going to be okay. So I'm going to try and move forward now to the next slide. And it doesn't seem to be responding to me. Ah, there it goes. So who are we talking about? Well, the first in our lineup is the person that most people think is the most difficult person of all to work with. And that's the bully, the screamer. This person is very intimidating. They uh, scream or yell. Uh, they might even curse. They are very much my way or the highway kinds of folks. Uh, and indeed, they are very, very difficult and upsetting uh, to work with. The next on the list is Negative Ned and Nelly and or Snipers. Negative Neds or Nellies, they're very negative about everything. Nothing is good. Nothing works well. You'll often hear them in a meeting say, that's not going to work, or we've tried that before and it doesn't work. Or they're sniping at you. They're making snarky personal attacks about you, like uh, whispering to a colleague so everyone can hear he doesn't know what he's talking about, or he doesn't know what he's doing, or that'll never work, and so on and so forth. 
The third type of person is agreeable al or ally. They're the exact opposite of negative net or nelly. Everything's great with them. Uh, the problem is that they often will overcommit. They'll say, yes, 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 I can do that. That's great. Let's do it. And then there's no follow through. They don't get it done. The fourth person on the list is Silent Sam or Sally. This is somebody who just won't participate, won't talk, won't respond. If you've ever had this person as a subordinate, somebody who reported to you, my goodness, they are a challenge to deal with. The next on the list is Expert Eric or Erica. This person's a know-it-all. They will lecture you on just about any topic because in many cases, they've done a lot of reading. They love reading. They love learning about things, and they can't wait to share it with you. The problem is, is they often tell you exactly how to do something, even if you are the expert in doing it yourself. And then finally, we have indecisive Ian or Inez. These are folks who just can't make decisions. Uh, they could be very agreeable. They could also be very negative. But at the end of the day, they just can't make a final decision and go forward. And I'll explain some of the reasons for these as we get into uh, the uh, seminar a little bit more. But I wanted to ask you all a question. I'd like, Jeff, if you could pull up the poll at this point. How many of you have had one of these people as either your boss, your colleague, or your direct report? If you could indicate that in the box, that would be great. Jeff, I believe you're going uh, to show me the results. Greg, I'm sorry to say we didn't actually um, plan on having that pod, uh, that poll pod created. I can do that right now. To just take me two seconds to get that up and running. If you want to just continue, I'm, I'm looking for that poll that we had already developed. That would be um, the questions that you wanted to ask at the end. So let me um, we had the build this real poll. quickly. Okay, I thought we had the initial poll. So essentially, I have a good feeling <laughs> or a bad feeling that every single one of you has had one or more of these folks uh, in your uh, life or in your work life. Uh, and in fact, I'm, I suspect that many of you are on this call on this set of webinar because you're currently dealing with one or more of these folks and you would like some help in doing that. So while Jeff is busy uh, putting that together, I'm going to go ahead and ask you uh, to move forward with me. And hopefully this will move forward. There it is. So what's the big idea? Well, Greg, can you see the, the poll that I just put up? Sorry, it took me a minute to get it up there. I'm sorry. I don't see it, Jeff. Not sure okay. why. Sure. Well, we've got people reporting back. 29% uh, have a bully or a screamer. 24% uh, uh, negative Ned. We've got some agreeable Al's. We've got silent Sam's. Uh, a couple expert Eric's. A couple indecisive Ian's. So, um, but the majority right now seem to be bully screamers and agreeable, or bully screamers and negative Ned's. OK. OK. I'm going to go ahead and end that, and we'll get back to your slides. All right. Very good. So the reality is, for most of us, we have at least one, if not many more, difficult people that we have to deal with at work. And it's very unlikely that our workplace has no effective process. The organizations we work for have no effective process for you to make a complaint about that person, let alone a formal process for effectively changing their behavior. And I don't have to tell any of you that this is very, very frustrating. The problem with most of this behavior is it falls below the line of discrimination or harassment, although many of us might call it harassment with a lowercase case h. Uh, unfortunately, it falls below the line. It is not exactly illegal to be a total jerk. And that's what so many of us find so frustrating because our workplaces have no formal process for making complaints about these folks and getting the behavior changed. Hopefully, I'll move forward here. There we go. 
let me talk a little bit about why this is so frustrating and upsetting for us. It has to do a little bit with brain science. When we perceive people to be difficult, what happens to us in our brains is we actually see this person and their behavior as a threat. It actually registered is in the brain stem of our brains. The brain stem is where the fight, flight, freeze reaction occurs. Whenever we perceive a threat, nine times out of ten, we will have either a fight, flight, or freeze reaction. And this is very, very common with almost every single one of us, unless we're very strange people. So that usually occurs within a quarter of a, sec of, of a second. The next thing that happens is that information flows into what's known as the limbic system. You may also have heard about it as the amygdala. The amygdala is a center, I call it the drugstore of the brain. And I know for those of you who are neuroscientists out there, this is really, really simplistic and uh, basic. Uh, but essentially, the amygdala is releasing all sorts of hormones into your bloodstream in a very rapid fashion when you have a fight, flight, freeze response. And what this results in is a very uncomfortable physiological, uh, physical experience for you. And also, you have an emotional experience. You get upset. And finally, after about a, um, a second and a quarter, your neocortex, neo meaning new, the newest part of the brain where all the higher thinking occurs, that kicks in about a, a quarter, uh, a second and a quarter after you have an emotional response. And so, again, if you're dealing with a difficult person, your brain perceives this as a threat. You have a, an emotional response that results from hormones being flooded into your system, and then you start thinking about what's going on, and you're saying to yourself, I don't like this, this is uncomfortable, this is upsetting. Meanwhile, you're having a fight, flight, freeze response. It's very, very uncomfortable. The problem gets even worse is even though the initial incident may be done, when we see the person again, we have a re-reaction, we are reminded of the earlier behavior, and we immediately categorize this person as difficult or as one of these uh, types of people that I uh, identified before, such as the screamer, the bully, negative Nelly, silent Sam, and so on and so forth. And every time you interact with that individual, it's as if you are looking at them through sunglasses. That you are always seeing them, sorry, my slide did not do what I wanted it to do. You're always seeing them through the lens of this person is a jerk, this person is difficult, this person's a bully, this person's a screamer. So you see it all over again every time you encounter them. It's a very uncomfortable and difficult place to be. And so what happens next? Well, what happens next is Generally speaking, we start to say to ourselves, there is nothing I can do about this. It's just the way they are. And we tend to ignore them. We tend to avoid them. We tend to work around them. Or, and or, we complain to others about, goodness gracious, my slideshow is just going nuts on me. Uh, hey, Greg, I'm sorry about that. I think we're running into a problem with just the internet connection. Um, it seems to me that you wanted to be on um, this slide here with the end ends where you ignore and avoid work around. Yep. And I'm just going to I'm just going to keep going, and hopefully we'll be okay. I wonder if it has to do with that. We've got a lot of people on it. Uh, that may be it. I, and I, I think also uh, just maybe give it a second. I think you might be seeing a delay, you know, uh, with just the internet connection. So maybe just give it a second to load. Okay. Sorry about and that. So that's all right. So what's a challenge for us is that many of us feel very powerless uh, to deal with all of this, and it also has a significant cost for 
our workplaces. Uh, not sure any of you are aware uh, uh, that there's actually a significant uh, financial cost to this kind of behavior. And uh, it, it can also result in uh, uh, serious problems for not only for you, but for the organization, uh, it, high levels of turnover, sick days, uh, conflict, sabotage, investigations, legal bills, you name it. Uh, and all of this, I think, uh, is a commonly known as money down the toilet. So I'm hoping there are some managers on the call who can really start to realize that we as organizations, as heads of organizations, have a responsibility to have a more formal policy and procedure for dealing with difficult people. Moving on, what do you do about all of this? Well, for most of us, we haven't had access to techniques and tools that we can manage this, uh, these situations, these difficult people with. And so back in the 1980s and 90s, a number of industrial psychologists and behavioralists like Robert Bramson, Dr. Bramson, started looking at these behaviors and trying to identify what actually could be strategies that you and I can use as individuals to cope with the behavior. And I call it active coping, because most of us feel like we have no control. There's nothing we can do. Well, there are some things that you can do yourself, even if your organization doesn't have a way of managing this stuff. You can actively cope with this behavior. And what we're, you're doing is short-circuiting the negative behavior that people are engaging in. You're breaking their cycle. And it can often result in changed behavior. Uh, not always, but can often work. And I want to caution you before I teach you these strategies. If you use them, there's going to be some risk of conflict. They might not go cleanly. They may not, may not go simply. And so you have to measure yourself how, how able are you to manage that conflict when it comes up. And I strongly urge any of you who choose to use these strategies to once again run them by HR Legal and also to practice, practice, and practice anymore. Moving on. Before you do them, identify a coping strategy that you specifically want to use. You might want to do a cost-benefit analysis. What's it going to cost me to do this? Especially if it's my boss. What if it backfires? How, do I have a backup plan? And have I practiced enough? So first person, the one that most people say they have to deal with is the bully, the screamer. Here's the behavior you'll see. They're intimidating. They're screaming. They're shouting. They may even be cursing at you. The goal in this technique, this coping strategy, is for you to stand up for yourself. Well, how do you do that? First of all, you have to recognize the behavior, and that's not very hard. It's coming right at you. It's in your face. So you need to breathe deeply. You will have, I guarantee you, a fight, flight, freeze mechanism. For me, I'm a freezer. I just stop breathing. And I look at the person. My eyes grow very wide. I'm a deer in the headlights. And I just can't believe that this is happening to me. So you need to take a very deep breath. There are a number of them. And that's good because as you're doing that, you can let them run down. Generally, the screamer or bully will get it all out in a very short period, maybe 20 to 30 seconds of screaming and yelling. What you need to do is just keep breathing and breathing and let them do it. Then, step four, you got to get their attention. Usually, that's by calling their name very sharply and clearly. Usually, you'll have to do this twice. Greg, Greg, and stop them in their tracks with a very sharp, loud, clear calling of their name. You can also, if you're sitting down and they're sitting down, you can also stand up suddenly. You need to change the dynamic in the room very, very abruptly. This will cause them to stop for a moment. 
Then, if you can, if they're standing up, ask them to sit down. There's a physiological reason for that. The blood pressure goes down, the heart rate slows down if people are sitting down. So you want to get them to sit down if they're standing. If they say, I'm not going to sit down, then you should stand up too. Be right face-to-face, eye-to-eye with them. Step six, maintain strong eye contact. Look right at them and state your opinions and your perceptions forcefully and clearly. You can start with the words, I feel the following. I believe this. My opinion is that. And you need to be very clear with how you feel. You can also call them out. You're screaming at me. I need to tell you what my opinion is. I need you to hear me. Now, what's really interesting is if you do these things, nine times out of ten, the bully will back down almost immediately. There'll be a sudden shift in their behavior because they're generally not used to anyone standing up to them. It's very, very interesting what will happen then. They will calm down almost immediately and start treating you as an equal, not somebody that can be screamed at or is easily intimidated. And so they're going to become your best friend immediately. And your reaction is going to be, I want to punch this person and they want to be friendly with me. Go ahead and be friendly. Do not punch them. Be friendly. This is proven over and over again that when you stand up to the bully, all of a sudden they turn around and realize, here's somebody who has the strength of character that I believe is necessary to deal with strong people like me. And so they see you as an equal, and all of a sudden they become your friend. It's a fascinating experience. It's also harrowing. But that is the process for dealing with the bully or screamer. I'm wondering, Jeff, if anyone is having any questions about this technique right now. We have uh, we haven't gotten any questions in. So um, again, folks, you're welcome to chat in with questions uh, as Greg's going through his presentation. Uh, Just use the question and answer. uh, chat box at the bottom of your screen. I, I do have one question that just came from, in from Ilda. What what if this behavior happens in front of other people in a meeting, Greg? Right. You can do this if you have the courage. You can do this in front of other people. Uh, it, it, it'll be your show with the bully. It'll be the two of you doing the show. Everybody else is going to sit there it, probably with their eyes very wide Uh, especially if this is your first time standing up to the bully. The hope is that no one else will pile on and attack the bully because then it's going to turn into a free-for-all. So, yes, you can do this in front of other people. It's just up to you to get through these steps as best you can, as clearly, as forcefully as you can. And nine times out of ten, the bully will back down as long as other people haven't piled on with you. Okay, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to give it a moment to advance itself for me. There we go. Negative Ned or Nelly and or the sniper. Again, the behavior you will recognize is they're saying everything is bad or won't work or they're making snarky little attacks on you in a public way. The technique you use here is by asking questions. It's very interesting what happens when you call the person out on their behavior by asking a question. Nine times out of ten, they will immediately back down. They'll stop doing it. So I'm hoping this will move forward for me. I just pushed it. There we go. So you need to openly surface the behavior using a question, such as, hey, I'm sensing uh, some negative response to this idea. Uh, Can you explain a little bit more about that? And nine times out of ten, they will uh, calm their response down. It won't be as negative. It won't be as snarky because you called them out on their behavior using a question. So I'm trying to get this to forward. There we go. 
So you can say things like, do I understand that you don't like what I'm saying? Or if the person's a sniper, hey, that sounded like a dig. Did you mean it that way? And they will usually back down if you ask them those questions. Then you offer them another option, something a little bit more peaceful, something a little bit more negative. You might even say, well, what's one positive way of seeing this? Or is there another way this could be interpreted? And if you're dealing with a sniper, you could say, could you explain specifically what your issue is with what we're talking about? And you notice these are all questions. You don't want to make statements to these people. You just want to ask questions. It causes them to start to behave in a more appropriate way than just the sniping or the snarky or negative remarks. And finally, if this is in a public situation, which is often where negative Ned and Nelly and the sniper are doing their thing, you want to seek other opinions by saying, asking the question, I'm wondering, do others agree with this person or do you have a different take on this? Nine times out of ten, once you ask that question, other people will chime in with other points of view that confirm or deny the sniper's point of view or negative Ned or Nelly. So overall, what you want to do with these folks is ask questions, open-ended questions. Get them to explain themselves because just sitting there and sniping is really inappropriate and difficult. The same with negative Neds or Nelly. You want to ask them questions. Well, why do you see it that way? What's another way to look at it? Give them alternatives and so on and so forth. I'm going to move on to the next person. Agreeable Al or Ally, as we said, is the exact opposite of negative Ned or Nelly. These folks think everything's great. You know, these folks are actually fun to be around because even the worst situations, they're seeing the silver lining. They're saying, this is great. Oh, no worries. We'll, we'll be fine. We're, we're a great team or we get along great or you're really smart or you know what you're doing. And these folks are just lovely to be around and they're great cheerleaders. The problem is they often overcommit. I have to admit that I'm kind of one of these people. I generally have a very positive, agreeable, upbeat kind of guy. And I will often overcommit. I'll say, yeah, we can do that or I can do that. I'll get it right back to you. And then I get back to my work and I'm like, oh, my God, I got so much to do. And I don't follow through. I don't finish up. So the goal with these folks is to hold them accountable using something that I call the verbal agreement contract. Well, what is that? It's really, really simple. You simply say to the person, especially if there's a, a subordinate who's being agreeable or a colleague, you say, here's what I think the task is that we've agreed to be involved in. Here's the project. Here's what we're going to do. And here's when it's supposed to be done. And so they'll say, yes, absolutely. I agree. Yes, that's right. We're going to do that. And you need to follow up with, I'm glad you agree. So I take it you're going to do these things by the date that you chose. And again, they'll say, yes, yes, absolutely. It's going to get done. Everything's great. Don't worry. And then you ask them. This is a, the key step in this technique. You say, okay, I'm not sure that I'm exactly clear on what we're agreeing to, even though you are. Can you mirror it back to me? Can you reflect back to me? So what is it you're going to do and when are you going to do it? And hopefully they will say, well, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and I'm going to get it done by this date. And you say, great, very good. It sounds like you uh, have got it all under control. And what you do is you identify a check-in date and time right next. You say to them, okay, I know I, you promised me you're going to do it in a month or so, but I'm going to check in with you in a couple of weeks to see how it's going. Because here's, here's the deal, everybody. They may commit to this deadline. They commit to doing the work and whatever, or the project. And yet, as soon as they get involved in it, suddenly they're behind schedule. So you want to check in before the due date and ask them how it's going. And what you may find is that they haven't exactly got things done. So if you're the boss of them, you need to narrow the task. You need to cut down on the number of things that they're going to be doing and repeat the process as above. Really state what it is you're going to, you're, that's supposed to happen and when it's going to get done. Make sure they mirror it back to you and give them another check-in time and so on and so forth. 
That's how you deal with agreeable Al or Ally who overcommits and doesn't follow through. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. And hopefully it will advance for me. Silent Sam or Sally. Now, did we have, Jeff, some people say they had some Silent Sams or Sallys in their lives? I, I think we did. Is that correct? Hi, Greg. Yeah, we had 11% uh, of people who responded to the poll uh, said they okay. had a Silent Sam or Sally. All right. I'm going to move quickly through then, uh, through this person. Generally, this is a person that's often a subordinate who doesn't want to talk, who simply won't respond, especially if they're in a situation where you're giving them some feedback on their performance and it's negative feedback. So what you need to do is get them to talk. And you do that also similar to uh, the uh, other folks, other techniques, ask them questions, open-ended questions. So what's your reaction to what I'm saying? What comes to mind when I say these things? It'll be like pulling teeth many times and they won't respond essentially by the way what we're what all of these folks have in common is that they have learned these techniques when they were children this is how they dealt with conflict and so the silent sam or sally generally deals with conflict by shutting down they don't say anything they don't respond another way to get them to start talking is to use what's called the friendly silent stare you have a nice smile on your face. You ask your question. So what comes to mind, Silent Sam, when you hear this? And then you look at them with a smile and you wait and you wait. Don't fill the silence. Don't say anything. Don't paraphrase what you think they're going to say. Because if you do, they'll just say, that's it. They'll nod and say yes, even though they may not be agreeing with you at all. Just wait. It's difficult to do. Once you've practiced it and tried it a few times, it gets easier. You can also call them out on the behavior in a non-threatening way. You could say something like, so here's what I'm noticing, Silent Sam. I'm asking questions, and you're not responding. Can you tell me, why do you think that's happening? And again, they may say things like, well, I don't feel like talking and so on and so forth. And it may be that you have to have repeated meetings with this individual and do the same technique over and over again until they finally realize that they are not going to get away with not talking, that sooner or later they're going to have to pony up and say something. Next slide is... Hopefully it will move forward for us. Expert Eric and Erica. Okay. I think we all have met one of these people at some point in their lives. They tell us how to do everything. They're a know-it-all. They lecture us, even though we may be the expert. This one's tough to deal with. Because sometimes these folks actually do know what you're, they're talking about. And you don't want them to get annoyed with you uh, because they might shut down to you. Uh, expert Eric's and Erica's are very often useful and helpful in our organization. The problem is they tend to think they're the ones who know best. And you need to be careful to make sure that they don't intimidate you and or anyone else with their knowledge. So... What you want to do with the expert Eric or Erica is listen very intently to what they say. Do not, whatever you do, ask clarifying questions. Well, what does that mean? Or can you, can you, like, uh, can you explain that even further? Because you are going to get a very lengthy lecture uh, on how to build a watch when all you've done is ask what time it is. But when they're doing their first know-it-all kind of lecture with you, listen intently, and then very quickly and succinctly paraphrase what they've said to you back to them very briefly. So what I think you're saying is X, Y, Z, period. Don't directly challenge them on their incorrect facts or instructions, especially if you're the expert and they start lecturing you about what you're an expert in. It's very likely they're going to say things that you know just aren't true. 
If you directly challenge them, you're going to get into a battle of facts of an inter and interpretation. So instead, you might say, well, interestingly enough, I've heard it interpreted differently. I've heard it interpreted as X, Y, Z. And you give them the different set of facts or instructions that you've heard. And you might also provide them with an, an alternative. You might say, you know, uh, we may not end up with any new insights on this topic, but it might be worthwhile to consider if the opposite were the case or if the facts were different. Is there another way for us to do this? Is there another way for us to consider this question? And so what you're doing is providing the expert, uh, Eric and Erica, with some alternatives to uh, consider without getting into a direct battle struggle with them. Also, you can ask what are called extension questions. So, okay, given what we know and other possibilities, how might that play out? Especially, you can ask that question if they're negative Nelly while being an expert at the same time. Very often, those two people tend to be inside of the same person. They're negative and they say, I already know all about this. That's not going to work. And so you can say that to them, okay, I hear what you're saying. You're saying that's not going to work. So how do you see it might play out if we went ahead anyway? How do you think that might impact the organization? This causes them to consider alternatives or other ways of moving forward. I'm going to move on, speaking of moving forward, to the next person who I believe is our last in our list. And that's indecisive Ian and Inez. The behavior you're going to recognize with these folks is they put off making decisions. They don't want to cause hurt or problems uh, with you. Uh, they, so what they generally do is they delay and delay and delay. If you've ever had a boss who is indecisive, Ian or Inez, oh my goodness, this is very, very frustrating for you. So your goal is to surface the issues, surface the challenges, surface the problems, and make it easy for them to be more direct about what's going on. So you can say to them, look, boss, I'm noticing it's taking a long time to make this decision. Can you tell me why you think that is? And nine times they're out of 10, they're going to say things like, well, I I'm very aware of how this decision might impact so-and-so or impact you. And so I'm reluctant to uh, make this decision because I know it could cause a lot of problems. Okay, you say. That's fine. I understand. Uh, if, if they're still having trouble uh, eliciting how the decision might impact you personally, you could say, look, be candid with me. Just tell me, give it to me straight. I'll be okay with whatever you say. Now, indecisive folks generally don't want to hurt people. That's why they don't make decisions, because they know sometimes their decisions can have very, very negative impacts. You might also listen for indirect clues or anxieties or hesitation, things they don't say. You could also coach them on the issue. If you're good at coaching, if you've ever done any coaching, you could say to them, would you be open to coaching? I'm wondering if you've explored all the impacts of the decision that you're unwilling or unlike, uh, having trouble making. Uh, how might it look if you went ahead and uh, made that decision? Or what's the worst thing that could happen? That's often a very powerful coaching uh, question. You can also co-develop with them an action plan. So boss or subordinate or colleague, uh, do you think that we could uh, come to a decision uh, in the next couple of weeks about this problem? And if they work for you and they're indecisive, you may actually have to take control. You may have to say, look, I'm going to take that decision and uh, work it myself. And uh, that's, going to, that's difficult if that person works for you because you're taking away some of their power and authority. So you have to be very, very careful when working with indecisive Ian or Inez. So this is all well and good. I've talked a lot about what you need to do with someone who is your subordinate 
uh, and also your colleague, and a little bit about your boss. I want to make it clear to all of you that when you are communicating with your boss, it uh, can be a, a very difficult situation uh, for you. And the reason why, it's because of the different positions we all adopt when we are communicating with each other. If we're talking about something that isn't loaded, that isn't about their difficult behavior, generally speaking, you and I can have, if it's my boss, I can have a, a, a unloaded content communication uh, dialogue with my boss without it uh, rising to a level of intensity or difficulty. And quite frankly, if the boss is giving me feedback about my behavior, I have to listen. The boss remains in what's called the one-up position while delivering the loaded content to me. But let's say it's your boss who is the really difficult position. You have to be in the one-down position. The boss is still the boss and while you are delivering loaded content to them. So here's th some things you can say in addition to using the techniques I've uh, told you about. You can say things like, boss, I'd like your permission to talk about what I'm sensing here. Or I wouldn't be doing my job, boss, if I didn't point out the difficulty that we're having. Or you can even be very open with them. You could say, I'm finding this difficult because I work for you. And you can also use what are called mutual purpose statements. Boss, you and I both want this project to succeed. We're both committed to this working out, aren't we, boss? You can use respect statements saying, boss, I really respect you. You're really good at X, Y, and Z. I have a lot of respect for you. And finally, you can use a contrasting statement. This is a very powerful statement where you say, look, boss, I don't think you meant to offend me. I don't think you mean to intimidate me. I think you're just trying to get problems solved. I think you're just trying to move the action forward. Contrasting statements are very powerful. Those of you who have ever taken a program or read the book Crucial Conversations will recognize these three last statements. Okay, so before we get into Q&A, I just want to remind all of you, this stuff is not easy. Doing these techniques is not easy. It's all well and good for us to sit here on the webinar and talk about the theory and the, of these techniques. It's a whole nother thing when you're in the middle of a meeting and someone starts pulling this behavior and you try to use one of these techniques. It's imperative that you find someone to practice with. You need to role play the technique with them. You need to figure out exactly what you're going to say and they need to play the character fully. They need to go at it with you and let you do it over and over again. Of course, this should be a trusted person who's not going to go around the organization and say, so-and-so is going to use the technique on the boss today. That would not be good. You need to do it in a secure environment, pretend, make it as real as you possibly can, and then repeat the behavior over and over again in practice until you feel comfortable and ready to do it. And I guarantee you, the first time you do it, you are going to be quaking in your boots. It's not going to be easy, but it will get easier as you do it more and more going forward. So quick poll, and I think we have that teed up, Jeff, is do you think some of you, how many of you think you will use some of these techniques you've learned today? Greg, you're able to see the poll now, or are we still having screen issues? I'm, I'm unfortunately not able to see it. Okay. Ah, there it is. There it is. Oh, oh wow. Great. Okay. Good. I see a lot of people are going to use it. Great. Uh, I, I really appreciate that. Now, uh, if you plan to use it, uh, will you promise me and commit to me, uh, swear in your heart that you will practice, practice, practice. Let's see. Hopefully we can get everyone 100% to commit to practicing it before you do it. And Greg, people are chatting in the answer to that. Hopefully you'll see it in a second. Okay, great. So far, we've got an 80-20 split of people who promised to practice and, and those who said probably not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, practice makes perfect, as they say, and uh, nine times out of ten, you will feel like a deer in the headlights the first time you're doing this. So if you do practice, that feeling will be less uh, intimidating for you. You'll feel uh, more able to move through the techniques in the process. All right, I would like to, I'm going to skip for a moment my 
final story, and instead, uh, I have a hunch that some folks have some questions, and so I'd like to go into that, Jeff, if that's okay. Absolutely. Thanks, Greg. Uh, we do have a couple of people who've chatted in with some questions, and, and we do have a few more minutes. So if you've got a, a burning question for Greg, please take a chance now to uh, type that into the Q&A chat box. Please keep them short. Let's, uh, let's try to just keep it to one sentence. Uh, and I'm actually, Greg, if, if it's okay with you, I need to make a small adjustment on my screen here so I can see all the questions as they come in. Um, so Rose asked an interesting question um, pretty early on in your presentation, Greg. How does race or gender impact these techniques? And she gave the example of when you've got a, uh, a bully or a screamer that you're trying to stand up to, if the bully is a female and the person standing up is a male, then the male suddenly becomes sort of uh, could be accused of um, you know having a gender bias so how, how do you how does race and gender impact what you've talked about today that's a great question in general the bully behavior is not limited to gender behaviors we although we often see it with men uh, the so-called alpha males uh, it, it we we have seen it with women as well and my experience is that the technique, uh, as long as you're not trying to bully back, this is, this is one of the big challenges when you're dealing with a bully and you're trying to get their attention. Uh, you too are so spun up emotionally that you might bully back. And if you're a man and the bully is a woman, people might say to you, well, you're just being a bully. Uh, and, and not recognizing that the, the woman is being a bully as well. So the trick is for you to be controlled in the way you are gaining their attention. You say their name sharply and clearly, but you don't get up into their face. You don't get close to them. Uh, you certainly can stand up uh, if it's a woman. All of these techniques are, are for use in the moment of the be difficult behavior, but not necessarily uh, are, are they to be continued to be used after the incident has occurred. Uh, now, if people, people won't necessarily accuse you of being a bully if you're a man and you're standing up to a bully uh, who's a woman. They won't accuse you of being gender biased in the moment, but you may be accused of that afterwards. People may say to you, boy, you really gave it to her, that was really inappropriate. Well, you, you can say she was engaging in bully behavior, regardless of male or female, we should not be allowing this kind of bullying and intimidating behavior in our organization. And I'm standing up to the bully in a, in a gender neutral technique. This is the technique that's used and that's what I'm doing. So you do have to defend yourself from the point of view of uh, uh, the technique is gender neutral. I hope that helps answer your question. People will interpret things the way they interpret it, by the way. If they think you're being a, a, a gender bully, uh, it's going to be very tough to prove that you're not. Uh, all you can do is say, look, these are, the behavior that person was engaging in is inappropriate for our workplace, regardless of their gender. Great, and Karen also, uh, my friend Karen, has uh, chatted in with a question um, that is, I think, really interesting uh, about how technology has changed the way that we're interacting with each other at, in a work setting, Greg. So Karen's situation is that she's having meetings over the phone, but then following the meeting, she's getting uh, emails that sort of attack her personal work ethic. So the question is, what's the best way to handle a negative Nelly when you're communicating with them via email or other electronic means? Well, that too is a very common situation. You can use the technique in writing in an email. My hope is, is that they're not uh, replying all in those emails, that they're sharing their negativity with everybody on the team. Uh, even if they are, though, uh, you can still use the technique in written form by asking them questions. What specifically are the issues that you have with this? Or I'm sensing negativity here. Can you explain what it is that you see is the problem? And then you could also provide alternatives. I'm wondering if you, you could start the email response with, I'm wondering if you uh, would consider there are other alternatives or other impacts to this strategy that we're considering. So again, ask a lot of questions in your email and don't respond with, uh, you're wrong, you don't know what you're talking about, and stuff like that. Harder to do in, e in an email format, 
a little bit easier to do uh, on a conference call. I know many, many uh, folks are <laughs> doing business by conference call these days. Great. Uh, Lisa's asking a question. You know, you touched on this, I think, a little bit, Greg, but could you talk a little bit more about how you would handle some of these difficult people when you're the boss and the, you know, your staff coming to you are, are some of these characters that you've talked about today? How does that change things at all? If st I'm assuming the question is about staff are coming to you and complaining about uh, difficult people. I think more so the question was about that her the people who report directly to her are the difficult ones and and I think she's wondering how do you sort of navigate that when when you're also the supervisor right and it, if you're the boss and you're not a difficult person then generally speaking you have the power and control to manage these difficult people uh, it, it it goes to my my final story and I know we only have a few minutes left uh, generally speaking, you have to manage your subordinates, even if they're difficult and disrespectful themselves, you have to manage them from a place of respect. You have to treat them with respect as best you possibly can. Uh, there's an old saying, you can't fight disrespect with more disrespect. So when people are being difficult, they're engaging in behaviors that they learned when they were children to deal with conflict and upset. You're not necessarily going to change that personality, but you can short circuit the behavior by asking them questions, by asking them open-ended questions, by getting them involved in a respectful conversation that helps them to see alternatives. Now, if you have a bully as a subordinate, that too, you can use the technique in the same way. You, you, you catch them, you, you stop them short, by distracting them, by calling their name clearly, succinctly, sharply, uh, at least twice, and that will, that will stop them from engaging in the behavior. And then, in, in fact, you need to stand up to your own subordinate and say, I need you to listen, I need you to listen to me respectfully, and I need you not to interrupt me, here is my point of view. Have I made myself clear? You have to be very strong with a bully, uh, no matter what. And for some of us, that is very, very hard to do. Great. Thanks, everybody, for your questions. We're running up against the hour, so I'm going to take this one last question from Patricia. Uh, Patricia actually has a bit of a curveball here for you, Greg. She's a, a teacher struggling with classroom management, oh uh, particularly in middle school. So how do these techniques change or work at all with you know young people, children? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that parents might also have a similar uh, question about how they can use some of the th techniques you described. Well, I, I generally, I'm a workplace consultants, and I, I, I would honestly say I don't have a lot of experience using these techniques with children. Uh, you can certainly use them with the parents of children when they come in to berate you about what an awful job you're doing with their child. You can certainly use these techniques with them as well. Uh, I, again, I, my, my recommendation is uh, find out what are the techniques that, that others are using in the education environment uh, that seem to have worked before. I, I have a hunch that some of them are similar to what I've introduced, but again, I, I, I have to beg off that question. I have not used these in an educational setting. I've used these in a workplace setting. Great. And Greg, we uh, have a number of folks who have said thank you so much for this presentation. They're wondering if they can get a copy of your slides, and you've yes. obviously got an answer listed here. Would you mind speaking to that? Yes, absolutely. If you would like a PDF of this slideshow, and uh, including the uh, notes, uh, or uh, if you'd like to be entered into a raffle to win <clears throat> my, uh, my book, Bad Behavior, People, Problems, and Sticky Situations, just send me an email to gward, <clears throat> excuse me, to gward at gregwardgroup.com, and Greg is spelled with three Gs, a total of three. And if anyone is interested in uh, taking this further, would like has, has more specific questions about situations that they're encountering, and would like a consultation, all BU alumni receive a 20% discount on the initial consultation. I'm happy to help all of you, and please, if you'd like a copy of my book, you can get an e-version online at Amazon, uh, as well as the hardback copy. And please link in and with me.
Yeah, I was going to say, Greg, we, we've got a couple questions that we just didn't get to that seem like short ones. Would people be, if, if they connect with you on LinkedIn, would you mind try, maybe trying to follow up with those folks? Absolutely. Absolutely. Or just send me a quick email and I'll do my best to answer the question. Great. Greg, thank you so much for your time today. Obviously, you know, we were talking before we got started, but so many of us, everybody's going to deal with one of these difficult and, and challenging folks in their work life. So you've really laid out some great suggestions for how people can deal with that. And on behalf of the entire BU Alumni Association, I really want to thank you for bearing with us through a couple technological problems today and just being here to offer your time. So thank you very much. My pleasure. If you learn one thing, everybody, breathe, breathe, breathe. <laughs> That's great advice. My thanks also go out to all of our guests for participating today. We've got a truly amazing webinar slated for January, and I can say that because I'm going to be the featured speaker that month. On January 26th, I'm going to be offering a detailed guided tour of all of the career resources and tools that are offered to BU alumni. Uh, and if you've ever had a question about the benefits of being an alum, that's a great uh, session to attend. You can sign up for that webinar now uh, on our website at bu.edu backslash alumni. And as always, if you or any BU alumni you know would be interested in presenting a professional development webinar like this for the BU community, I'll ask that you please contact me directly at the Alumni Relations Office or by email at jt, as in Thomas Murphy, at bu.edu. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Have a great day or a great evening wherever you might be.